Welcome everyone to our second lecture of the series. <laughs> um, please, please um, turn off your cell phones. And we are also still looking for someone who ha is familiar with uh, front page forum who is willing to put a little blurb on there in the first of the week about our lectures. Any publicity that you can do is a big, big help to us. We want this organization to continue. And now, Beth, would you introduce the speaker? It's a great pleasure to welcome Scott Finn. Scott grew up in rural Iowa. He earned his bachelor's degree at Harvard, and he became a VISTA worker in West Virginia, and in his own words, a really, really bad whitewater rafting guy. <laughs> his words, not mine. Thank you, um, <laughs> uh, He then returned to graduate school and earned his master's in journalism from the University of Missouri at Columbia. He became an award-winning reporter in the largest newspaper in West Virginia in the state capitol, and then later became the CEO and um, executive director of West Virginia Public Broadcasting, which incorporates both uh, public radio and television across the state of West Virginia. This past May, he became the new president and CEO of Vermont Public Radio. And he remains very active on the national uh, public media landscape in developing new collaborations and working with new ideas um, with other public radio folks. So it's with great pleasure that we introduce and welcome Scott Finn. Am I on? I think we're good. Uh, can you hear me in the back? OK, we'll, so we'll keep working on it. Uh, how about now? Is this any better? You hear? OK, good. Um, hi, I'm Scott Finn, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and in doing so, talk about journalism and the state of journalism today, and the state of journalism in Vermont. There's some bad news, and then there's some good news. So you'll get a little bit of both, and then we'll open it up to questions. And I really want to hear, uh, and also suggestions. Uh, you'll, you'll hear in a second, but I'm extremely excited I can't believe I got this job at Vermont Public Radio. Uh, they're silly enough to hire me. My family loves Vermont, and uh, I'm really, really grateful to be here. By the way, bonus points if anyone knows where this is. Rutland. Rutland. That was part of our Tell Me More tour. OK, so who am I? Um, I grew up in a family of five in rural Iowa. My dad was an appliance repairman. My mom um, watched kids for a living, including us. Um, <laughs> and then later owned something that doesn't even exist anymore called a Sears catalog store. <laughs> Some of you might not know what that is, uh, but anyway, that's, that's what their story is. Um, and that's us adult children today and my mom. Um, a little story about my mom. Half the reason I'm here actually is VPR. The other half is because, and don't either give me credit or hold it against me, but my mom has a little bit of a crush on Bernie Sanders. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so um, you know, my brother and I are in a constant competition about who's uh, the favorite son. And guess, well, guess who's ahead right now? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I grew up in rural Iowa. I went to Harvard on a scholarship, person my family to go. It was a wild experience. And then I wanted to go back to a rural place. And I joined Vista, and they sent me to Big Ugly Creek, West Virginia. This is sign proves it is a real place. It does exist. It's actually a small, beautiful place. It looks a lot like places in Vermont, actually. Um, and they sent me to a place called the Big Ugly Community Center, <laughs> which um, it, what, at the time, what it was, it was an old school that had closed down four years ago, and they hadn't done anything to, to, to fix it up. And so all the windows were broken. There was trash throughout the whole building, and it was being used for uh, a place for, for taking drugs, basically. And so they plopped me, this kid from Harvard slash Iowa, in the middle of Big Ugly Creek, and they're like, fix it. I don't know anything. I can't fix anything. I don't have any connections in the community. I start kind of sitting outside the community center and just, I don't know, waiting for something to happen. 
at, at the end of the day, the kids get off the bus and they go walking back up the holler, that's what they call it there, the holler toward their homes. And so they would stop and we'd play a little bit, you know, on the playground equipment, basketball. Very next day after that happened, all the mothers in the community came out. I mean, all of them. And they're like, who's this weirdo that's playing with our kids? <laughs> and I told him my story of woe. Uh, I was like, I've been sent here, I don't know what to do. They brought out mops and buckets. They got water directly out of the creek. Um, someone, you know, uh, had a retired father who knew how to do electricity and plumbing. Someone else knew the guy that run, ran the, the, the prison system and got them to come out and help clean. Someone else had someone with a dumpster company. I mean, everybody had connections somewhere. And we ended up turning this thing into, this is 25 years ago, into a, a community center that's still there to this day. Um, and, and in West Virginia, that's a real special thing because there are not really towns in West Virginia. It's not like here. There are some towns, but there are lots of places that are unincorporated communities. They don't, they don't have a government for themselves. The school was their whole life and their whole center. When Big Ugly lost their school, it lost their identity. By the community fixing it up, they, they regained their identity. They have a place to walk, a place to have their events. Big Ugly was kind of my graduate school, I think. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I decided I wanted to be a writer and a reporter. Um, this is me at a fun drive, my first fun drive. Look how excited we are on our end. <laughs> we don't like it any more than you do. But um, I was, I, oh, excuse me, I was a reporter for first West Virginia, uh, West Virginia's newspaper, the Charleston Gazette, and then later for West Virginia Public Broadcasting, and then a, a station in Tampa called WUSF. So that's kind of my story. Um, I ended up that's my son, Max. I ended up leaving reporting for lots of reasons, but Max was the main reason. So my son, Max, has autism. Um, and he's, he, uh, there's a spectrum of people with autism. He's on the more severe side. He doesn't speak. And so it's taken a lot of energy and a lot of resources and, frankly, a lot of money to be able to get him the help he needs. And so I left reporting and went into management, basically. And so that's why I'm running a station today. It's because of Max. By the way, um, I, I'm told by other Vermonters that I'm not supposed to tell you where this is. Now, this is a secret swimming hole somewhere near Jericho, and I'm not allowed to share it. But it is in Vermont. Um, anyway, oh, by the way, he's learning how to ski and to uh, ice skate. Uh, he's loving it. It's all free, too. There's this program called Kayla's Directory. Vermont's wonderful. Um, Vermont Adaptive Skiing is great, too. You might have seen him out on the slopes. I can't believe all the things he's able to do here. Okay, so I told you I worked for a newspaper in West Virginia, right? That's where I started. Two things happened to my newspaper recently. They won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting around opioid abuse. They uncovered the fact that these companies were sending truckloads of, of painkillers and, and very powerful painkillers into extremely tiny towns. So in a way that could only mean that they were being diverted and sold on the street. That, that's what they uncovered. One of the Pulitzer Prize, I was both glad and really jealous, <laughs> and they went bankrupt within the same year. This is happening all over America, of course, right? Um, and why should you care? I mean, some of you do already, and that's great. Some of you are wondering, well, okay, so what, what, what does it matter? There's a lot of studies going on now about what happens when a community loses its newspapers and its reporters. Um, one thing that's happening is there's actually been a correlation. Communities that lose their newspapers are more likely to be uh, polarized, uh, politically polarized. There's something about not having a community newspaper that makes people more likely to be on each uh, sort of far end of an issue instead of being more in the middle. There is also research that says when a newspaper dies in a community or when it gets cut way back, all of a sudden, the cost of government goes up. Um, in other words, people aren't watching, and so there's more waste and inefficiency in government. And then finally, there's more corruption. There's a direct co correlation between the number of reporters in an area and the amount of corruption that um, is prosecuted. So, even if you, I, mean, I know you cared in general, but even if you didn't really care that much and see how it affects your life, you can see a lot of things about the loss of journalism affects democracy, basically. These are all things that you need for democracy. A shared understanding of the facts, 
um, you know, a lack of corruption, uh, efficiency in government. And so, and by the way, the, the layoffs they're talking about in this story were not newspaper layoffs. The thing that's starting to happen now is all of these new um, media organizations that are online, like BuzzFeed, they're starting to lay off people too. And so that was supposed to be the salvation, and it turns out it may not be. Okay, why is this happening? It's not because people stopped reading newspapers. That's, a, that's not right. People stopped reading uh, as many print newspapers, but more people are reading newspaper stories than ever before on the internet. What happened is the economic model fell apart. And so what this shows is uh, print newspaper revenues going up to about 1999, peaking at $67 billion. And then for a while, they go down a little bit. And then all of a sudden, newspapers figure out, oh, I can make some money off of digital. And they start making a tiny bit of money on digital on top of the print. And then there's this cliff. And part of the cliff is the recession. But part of the cliff is Google and Facebook. And those are just two of the digital entities that are sucking the revenue. Another one is like Craigslist. Um, so the revenue is coming from advertising and coming from classifieds. Newspapers used to make most of their money on ads and classifieds, actually still do. But now there are all these other ways of getting these ads that bypass the newspapers. So their, their revenues have plummeted. And that's had a real effect on the number of jobs that newspapers are able to have. Um, you know, I come from West Virginia. You've probably seen stories or heard stories about coal miners being laid off in West Virginia. It's absolutely true. Um, there are other industries that have lost a lot of jobs. Steel, uh, steel mills, people who work there. The fishing industry. Newspapers have lost more jobs than any of those industries. There's a more of a loss of jobs percentage-wise in the newspaper industry than in mining or the steel mills or fishing or all these other industries we think of as being places where there's a lot of job loss. I promise it'll get better, hang with me. <laughs> Here's another one, so you might think, okay, um, that's happening nation nationally, but Vermont, we're different. We're exceptional in Vermont. Maybe this isn't as much of a problem in Vermont. Luckily, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps detailed numbers of the number of professionals working in the media in Vermont. And it keeps numbers on two types of media professionals, and both of them are so important I'm not at all denigrating public relations professionals. They do in incredible work, they're important people. So one of these numbers is pr public relations professionals. The other number is reporters, announcers, people who do journalism. In 1997, there were about the same number of people who did public relations and people who did journalism in Vermont. About 500 each. See what happens in 2002. 2007 and 2017. So what's going on here? Essentially, the number of people in public relations has more than doubled, while the number of people in doing reporting and journalism type jobs has been cut in half, roughly. Um, and so you, what, that, what does that mean for us and for democracy? You have more people who are paid to tell a story, and the people who pay them, you know, they, that's who they listen to. They, they're not unethical, but their job is to tell these people's stories. And people who are paid by you to try to just tell the things that you need to know, there are a lot fewer of them. So not, not so great. Um, so of course, I'm from Vermont Public Radio. Uh, one of the answers, and just one of the answers, is public radio. One of the things that VPR has done, and by the way, um, Jen, right? Jan? So I met Jan earlier who's one of the original donors to Vermont Public Radio. If we can everyone, give everyone Jan a hand real quick. <laughs> and by the way, there's probably other people in this room that either are also original donors or are darn close to it. Um, thank you. Um, you built this thing. And you're going to see one of the things that you built. For those of you who've been listening to VPR for four decades, you realize that it started out mostly as uh, national news and classical music, right? That was the majority of it. But as the number of uh, journalists started declining at the newspapers, Vermont Public Radio started trying to fill some of the gap. And so in 2001, there were only three professional journalists at VPR. And look what's happened. Okay, so we're up to about 20, 21 now. Now, 
21 is a lot more than three. <laughs> but it's not the 200, and 200 or 250 that we've lost over the last 20 years. So we're trying to fill some of the gap. And I think there's a lot more work to be done. There are other entities in the state that are also doing a good job trying to fill the gap. Um, there's Seven Days, which is a for-profit, but also uh, has a lot of journalism, has been ramping that up. And VT Digger is a nonprofit journalism organization that's online. Um, and the community newspapers, a lot of them are trying really hard to hold on to what they have as well. And I'm not denigrating any of the newspapers, but they have, as you saw from the revenue uh, screen, they have some real challenges. Um, okay, so when I got here, uh, I arrived in May. I don't know anything about Vermont at all. Uh, when I was in college, I used to take some inner city kids from Boston on backpacking trips in the Green Mountains. And we went to Ben and Jerry's at the end, and that was it. That's my whole <laughs> knowledge of Vermont. Um, and so the first thing we did is the entire station uh, did a tour of the state called the Tell Me More Tour. And we ended up going to 14 different locations every county of the state of Vermont. When I got here, actually, this is what I didn't know. I thought that in West Virginia, counties mean something and people pay attention to them. So I said, let's go to every county. And the staff looked around and said, OK, we could do that. But no one knows what the counties are or really cares about them here. But anyway, went to all 14 counties. Um, we talked to 750 people directly who showed up at our events. Uh, it wasn't just me. You know, our morning host, Mitch Wortlieb, was in Routland. Jane Lindholm came to several of these. We had all of our staff. Every staff member went to at least one of these. And we talked directly to listeners and non-listeners. And we asked, you know, well, what do we need to do? Uh, what's important to you? And this word cloud is an example of the bigger the words, the more often we heard what people wanted us to do. They wanted us to do more education. They wanted us to do more arts more good news. <laughs> now, it's funny, everywhere, 13 counties I went to said, your coverage is too Burlington-centric. And then I went to our Burlington event, and they're like, you never cover Burlington. <laughs> so I, I do think there are issues there, perception. Uh, people said that they want us to not just tell them what's wrong, but also to give solutions, or potential solutions. And I'm hoping I'm going to do that in this presentation <laughs> in a minute, hang on. And then also, um, they want us to be, they want more. I mean, when you lose 200, 250 reporters over 20 years, you wish that they were there. We went to Island Pond and someone said, can you come cover you know, the, the, the town government here? The short answer is probably not. You know, 251 towns, am I right on that? Yeah. You know, you, you, know, you can do the math, you know, 20 reporters, 251 towns, we can't cover all the town governments. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out new models for doing that. And one model would be partnerships. So instead of the media working at cross purposes here, I think actually we need to start working a lot more together. And one thing we're doing is we're partnering with PBS. Um, and, and I have a good friend called Holly Groshner who's the CEO over at PBS. I used to run a PBS station in West Virginia. And so there are a lot of things we can do together. We held the debates together for the first time. Um, and so people could see for the first time Jane and Bob, that's them right there, uh, doing the debates. Um, and uh, B PBS benefited because Jane and Bob are really good at doing debates. So we both got something out of that. Um, that's just one example. I'll tell you about another in just a second. So the poll. Used to be there was something called, um, oh gosh, it was the Polling Institute, the Castleton Polling Institute. Some of you might know what that is. It's, it was based out of Castles and University, and it would do nonpartisan polling of Vermonters. And then there were budget cuts, and Castleton University eliminated the polling institute. But the man who ran it, Rich Clark, is still there, uh, still teaching, and still has all that knowledge about how to run a poll. All he needed was someone to come in and pay for it, essentially. So that's what Vermont PBS and VPR did. We pooled our money together, we split the cost, and we had two polls. And if you heard any sort of polling that said, uh, Governor Scott is so far ahead of Christine Hallquist, or that was our poll. We were the only nonpartisan poll of, of the election last year. We didn't just poll the election, we also polled issues. Like, what do you think is the most important problem facing the state of Vermont today? 
And there's a group of answers that people gave that basically comes down to jobs, the economy, and how much it costs to live here. That's the biggest thing. Second was our drug problem and addiction. Third was taxes. And then there's a whole panoply of other issues that were important too. So this is actual data. You know, People can go around and say, I think the most important issue is taxes. And I can say, well, our poll said the most important issue is economy, jobs, and the cost of living. Um, we ended up doing news stories about this. Uh, we have a new thing we do together called the News Minute that's on uh, PBS NewsHour. Uh, we, were, we did a joint Vermont This Week, Vermont edition. And so we're trying to figure out ways that by working together, we can take our limited resources and have it go farther and reach more people. We're also, by the way, doing experiments with Digger. We've been reaching out to Seven Days. We're all trying to figure out how we can basically maintain what we have in Vermont as far as our journalism and build a better future. And I think that future is going to be different than the past. I think we're going to move from the journalists saying, well, we decide what the story is, to more answering the questions that you have, the audience telling us more about what we should do. Matter of fact, VPR does a lot of this already. We have a, a program that's called Brave Little State. Every month, people ask questions, and then online, people vote for the most popular question, and then we answer it. And then we put that answer on the air. It's, it's a really popular, especially as this thing called a podcast that people can listen to um, you know, on their own. We have a show called But Why. It's for kids. But Why is actually, believe it or not, our most popular program on the internet. We've had a hundred, every episode, Jane Lindholm does it, who is the host of Vermont Edition. Jane Lindholm does this as well, she's a superwoman. Uh, and the, uh, Verm but every episode of But Why receives 100,000 people over the world that are listening to it right now. And it keeps, and it keeps growing. Uh, what is But Why? Kids ask questions. They record it onto their phones, and then they send that recording into Jane and a producer, and then they answer the question. That's it. It's as simple as that, but it's a lot of fun. We also did a live show recently about owls. People, kids have questions about birds, and so we, we actually at the Latches Theater, we brought some birds in and did one of those shows. Like the, uh, they used to do that, I think, on the Johnny Carson show where they would bring in animals. And <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was a little crazy, but it was a lot of fun. And of course, there's Jane. Uh, she also does Vermont Edition. That's our weekly, I'm sorry, our, our, our daily talk show. It's on at noon and again at seven. And what is that? It's answering your questions. We pick a topic, but then we take calls. So it's not a new thing, answering questions. But I think that you know, journalism has to be more what they call participatory uh, for it to survive. And, and we have to both be more responsive to what you want us to do. We might have to partner with you more often as well. In other words, ask you to help us cover the story. Okay, I already talked about this a little bit. I, in the past, there, the media organizations saw each other as competitors. You know, to the newspaper and the different radio stations and the three TV stations, they were all like, they, they didn't, they thought that each other were the competitors. They wanted to get the story first, no matter what. And sometimes they would rush to put a story on the air before it was ready because you wanted to make sure that you know, the other radio station didn't get it first or the, you know, the other newspaper didn't get it first. Um, and that worked really well when there were lots and lots of reporters and lots of media organizations. But now, with fewer of us, I think we have to talk more about working together because there's just not enough to go around. And then finally, well, you're already seeing this take place. Um, for-profit organizations, in the, especially in news and local news, are having more trouble surviving. And so we're going to more of a model of public service where people see journalism as a, a cause to support as much as anything else, not just a, a something that you purchase. Even Seven Days, I don't know if you knew this, but Seven Days just got a grant um, to do coverage of opioid addiction and how to deal with it. That's new. They're for-profit. I mean, they're owned by two women, but they are receiving philanthropic help to do reporting now. That's getting to be more and more common. There's an organization called Report for America that's doing a lot like what Vista did for me. They're taking young idealistic people and they're training them and they're sending them to parts of the country that are news deserts. And they're helping to you know, get those young people to cover stories that are going uncovered. So 
that is basically it. Um, you know, I can also talk a lot about VPR. It's so cool, I love it. Uh, it has problems, and I wanna hear those from you as well. Um, and I can talk about NPR a little bit. I, I, we don't control NPR, but I can answer questions you might have about it. Um, or I can talk more about journalism in the future of journalism here. So thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. Questions, comments, concerns? We have one here. Yes, sir. Would you comment on the uh, trend of venture capital firms to take over newspapers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you see examples of that, uh, like the Denver Post. Uh, you're probably thinking of that. The, uh, these are award winning newspapers, did spectacular work. They're bought by these venture capital firms, and then they're basically being stripped for parts. Nobody says that when they buy a newspaper. But essentially, all they're doing year after year is they're cutting the staff of the paper faster than the falling revenues. They're trying to milk as much money of it, but it's on a death spiral. Um, and some of these papers, that, I mean, there are, are cities where, like Denver, where some of these papers are only 10 years away in that death spiral from going away entirely. I mean, it's, it's the end days for a lot of these folks. And so the urgency for us to step forward and find a new model for protecting, you know, I don't think it has to be newspapers, but it has to be great journalism. We have to figure that out. Um, and I'm, I don't have any stats on like the Burlington Free Press or, or some of the newspapers here per se. I think it's happened slightly slower in Vermont than some other places, um, but it's happening here too. So yeah, that's really disturbing. The papers that are doing well, like the Washington Post, um, you might, its owner was in the news yesterday. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, it's usually, they are making money, but it's their national organization. They have such huge scale. One of the things that NPR stations are doing is we're learning how to work together to be able to have scale. So I can be a small station with 20 reporters, but I'm part of a national organization. NPR has more than 1,000 reporters across the country. Only 300 of those 1,000 reporters are at NPR. The other 700 are at hundreds of member stations all throughout America. And we're trying to figure out how we can work together to take advantage of that scale. Uh, this is a serious question. Um, is there a way to turn off Twitter? Uh, you could delete it. No, but I mean so that nobody can use it. Oh. <laughs> um, I can get myself in trouble here. By the way, before it goes back, could you, could you introduce yourself? I want to learn some names and, and just know where you're from a little bit, if you don't mind, ma'am. And then I, I will. It's a serious question. Uh, my name's Jan Orlansky. I'm originally from St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. And um, I, we've been living here for the last eight years. And I love it here, too. And uh, I'm just tired of hearing all the Twitter that's going on, and it's really hard to avoid it. And it's hard to avoid it in the newspapers, it's hard to avoid it on TV, and um, on the internet. It is hard, and one of the things that, so I, I have not deleted my Facebook account, but I deleted the application on my phone, the app on the phone. I, I, I made it harder for myself to go to Facebook. I did that on purpose because I, I no longer personally feel like it's a benefiting me as much anymore. And it's sad because there are some family photos that I don't get to see because I'm not there as much. That's why I've lost, but um, especially living in West Virginia, uh, it was one of the states that was targeted during the 2016 campaign um, by all sorts of people, including apparently the Russians. There was some nasty, nasty stuff going on. And it was, I, I, it was bad for my mental health. Um, I guess the only way you, would, you, you could stop Twitter is by having the government regulate it, or, or I mean, really, that's the only way I could think of. Um, seems un unlikely right now, but, but unlikely things have happened before. Here's the last thing. I kind of wonder whether public media needs to be thinking about, you know, why did public television start and why did public radio start? Because the commercial TV and radio weren't doing certain educational things that were necessary. It filled a need. Social media right now is all commercial. 
it's not nonprofit, maybe there's a need for alternative social media too. You know, like a different place to go. My friend Michael, uh, who works at the Front Porch Forum, if someone was just mentioning that, mm -hmm. I think the Front Porch Forum actually is a really interesting model for social media. That's because that's what it is. Um, that other parts of the country might be able to, to copy and replicate. Uh, it's not perfect. I mean, social, you know, but, but people in, in the Jericho Front Porch Forum make sure that people don't go too far off the rails. It's moderated, and I don't know what it's like for your towns. Um, so anyway, long answer. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Rita Bortz, and we moved here because we love Vermont back in 1966. And I'm not sure exactly when public radio in Vermont started. 1977. I know that we used to love it because we listened to Lertzimer, the music, the classical music in the morning. Oh. And one day he was at, I think it's Tanglewood out in the Berkshires, and there were birds. And our cats were going berserk. <laughs> Where are these birds? <laughs> the birds. <laughs> but we listened to Lertzimer, you know, all the time. We loved his music and we loved public radio. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I mean, we're lucky here that we have a full um, time, 24 seven classical music service as an alternative. And almost everybody in Vermont can get both of them. We're really lucky that way. I'm actually Rita's neighbor. Um, my name's Karen Katie, and we're all both in the same neighborhood. I got kind of a green question here. Did Joan Crock's money, um, was it invested over the long haul for all the stations around the country to use? Was it just held by California for their stations? I wasn't sure how, going forward, Joan's generosity is being managed. So that's a great question. So this is Joan Crock, who is the uh, heiress to the McDonald's fortune. Um, little story. Um, so uh, J Joan Croc reached out to, oh gosh, I'm gonna get in trouble. No one at PBS is gonna watch this. Joan Croc reached out to the local PBS station, NPR PBS station in San Diego, and said, I'm really interested in making a gift, and I wanna talk to the people at PBS and NPR as well. Um, and the people at PBS, for whatever reason, didn't get back to her. The people at NPR did, and guess what? The money went to the San Diego station and NPR. So a, a little lesson about being responsive there. Um, the, croc, uh, fel the croc money is mainly supporting, uh, at NPR at least, I know it's supporting a fellowship called the Croc Fellowship. And every year there is a, a, a cohort of young reporters that is paid for by the Croc Fellowship, and they're learning their craft. Um, they, they spend time at NPR, but then they also spend months at member stations throughout the country, including sometimes VPR, learning their craft. And almost everybody you hear on the air today that's under the age of 30 was a Croc Fellow. It is the engine of all the new talent. So that's the majority of what NPR is spending her money on. You're welcome. Yes, sir. During the 16 election, were there many people in West Virginia who were aware that you were being targeted by really partisan false news? I didn't even really understand it at the time. I mean, there was some reporting around fake news, but that was coming late in this, like I, I remember seeing a BuzzFeed article about fake news in October. And that's when I started to realize, oh, something is going on here. And I was in the media. It took us a while. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I, you know, it's funny. Um, so Ver Vermont is, according to Gallup, the state that has the lowest approval rating for Donald Trump. And West Virginia, <laughs> according to Gallup, is the state that has the second highest approval rating for Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and I'm not gonna make any like you know opinions about that. Uh, but what's interesting, though, is that there are lots and lots of West Virginians that don't like Trump. And there are lots of Vermonters, and I, I meet them, that do. And so we're not as different as we might think. Um, and there are a lot of the same problems, a lot of the same issues. If, if I go to um, uh, Island Pond or Springfield, Springfield reminds me of the steel mills in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, those towns. Um, and, and so it's, it's not as different as you might think. Um, the main difference I see here though, honestly, the town system means that everybody has a government um, that's local and responsive to them. 
And it seems like people are more engaged in that government here. And that actually makes a huge difference. There's less cynicism. I know people, I'm not saying things are perfect at all, don't get me wrong. But in general, people have more hope that they can change things for the better. That's the biggest difference I see. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm Sylvia Ewert, and I live in Huntington. So uh, I listen actually on HD radio. And th there, there's three of them as far as I'm concerned. So I listen to the BBC a lot when I can manage to understand their English. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, so you're telling me, and we've talked about this before. So HD radio is a special type of radio. It's not your normal analog radio, and you have to have a special radio in your car, in your home to get it. And but the, the, one of the benefits of HD radio, besides the fact it sounds better, is that you can have three channels on the same 107.9. So you have 107.91, 107.92, 107.93. Uh, the first one is our news station, the one you're used to. The second one is our classical station, but it's in HD. And the third one is the BBC feed, 24-7. And you're saying keep the BBC feed, don't replace it with like country music or something else. <laughs> Add country music. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, thank you. And thank you for listening, I really appreciate it. Any other questions about, or, or you can give me suggestions. I mean, one of the things I'm looking for too is, what should we be covering? What sort of issues should we cover about Vermont? That sort of thing. Hi, my name is Jan Hughes and I'm recently retired from Burlington High School. I'm delighted in looking back at, at Burlington High School kids to see the strong strand of journalism that's coming through that school system mm -hmm. under two different teacher leaders. One of those young men has gone on to Vermont Digger. The second round of folks happens to be more female than male and was involved in a suit that you may or may not be aware of, I hope you are, I am. Um, recently around school news issues and their right to publish that. I'm intrigued by and um, encouraged by youth in that category still making a commitment to print because I think it informs and, and moves <laughs> us on your success side of this. Um, and I don't know what else we can do statewide um, to encourage that group who we need so badly to hear from um, because we, we can't keep creating the news and, and hoping it's relevant and important down through all those generational differences. You know, one of the things that I found very heartening about the tour um, and in, in, in situations like this, a lot of people that come to events like this because of the time of day, lots of reasons, t tend to be you know, folks that are retired or uh, you know, on, on, on that side of, of things. And, um, but always you hear about what are you doing to get young people involved? What are you doing to make sure that the next generation is, is engaged and listening and learning? I, I really love that about Vermont too. And one thing we're trying to figure out is can we, how do we get more youth voices on the air? I would love to have just a full-time person to work with teachers to figure out how to train young people to use radio um, as a teaching tool. I'm a former teacher too. I used to teach sixth grade English and social studies. Um, you know, and, 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 but I, and print first though. You know, uh, the best radio reporters are great writers. It starts with that. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, it all comes back to resources. And you know, one of my jobs is to thank the people that support us and convince other people to support us in ways that might allow us to do things like have a youth radio program. That would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah. My, name is, uh, my name is Bill Eddy and I am a seventh generation Vermonter. So I've grown up in this area. And this is a general question about local news. What has happened to um, Channel 3 and Channel 5 um, when I was growing up, you had two stations. You had three and five. You had 100% local news. Now, and I know because they're owned by uh, bigger corporations, they're not locally owned anymore, half of what they spend their time on is on national news. And you're going to watch the national news later on anyway, probably. Is this the trend now in the local news market? Or? Yes. And you, kept, you held on to um, more local news for longer than a lot of markets. Uh, yeah, it's, if you watch the news in West Virginia or Colorado or anywhere, what's happened is there are more local newscasts. In other words, sometimes there used to be just one or two, like five 
or five and six or whatever. Now, sometimes some of these stations it's on for like an hour or two hours, but most of it, a lot of it's not local anymore. Um, and that's a fun, it's financial. The pressure is, you know, it's cheaper to have national news and repeat it on your air than it is to make your own news. Making news is so expensive. Um, and what the people do at television stations, and again, I worked for PBS and I was a reporter on the PBS station uh, in West Virginia, and so it's extremely difficult. When I was a print reporter, I used to make fun, I'll admit to this, I used to make fun of the TV reporters. Like, oh, that's so shallow, or you know, can't they, you know, no, it's so, but if you try, running out to something, figuring out what's going on very quickly, and standing up live and talking about it, it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, and there are just, just like at the newspapers, there are just fewer people at these TV stations. Um, that's what it's all about. And there are fewer people there because the revenues have started to go down. And they're trying to figure out, they're all trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to keep it going in, in the face of that. It's tough. Yeah. Hi, Scott, and thanks for this uh, information and the chance to dialogue um, with us. I'm Mike Orlansky. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. And like Jan, we've lived in Burlington for about eight years. I was wondering about the career path for your reporters. Glad that you've hired so many good uh, reporters, but do they tend to, are, are they likely to stay for a long time in Vermont, or is it considered sometimes a stepping stone to national positions with NPR? You certainly have some great uh, on-air personalities and reporters and journalists who could, could do very well at the national level or at a bigger station, and um, wondered if you'd uh, comment on that. Also, we wake up every morning to Mitch Wortlieb's sports report, <laughs> and I like that a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mitch is a good example. So Mitch was working at the Boston NPR station as a producer for a long time. And why would he leave a larger station to come here? I, I think what I've heard him say is he want, it's a higher quality of life, um, but also he can do his sports report here. You know, and, and he has a little more freedom. And I, I think he also likes being more in touch with the audience, all those things. So, so to answer your question, some people, um, we do have some folks that, that cut their teeth with us and move on, and that's great. More and more, though, I, I'm looking for people that really want to stay. It seems ironic, because I'm a Flatlander who just got here. Um, <laughs> but I think that journalism is something that lots of smart people could be taught how to do. And what I look for first is someone who's knowledgeable and passionate about Vermont and the issues that we face and has a great attitude and a good work ethic. And if they have all those things, you can train them to be a journalist. Um, and we were lucky that most of the people that work for VPR stick around. We've lost some, but the, you know, Jane's are another great example of that. We're so lucky to have. These are, I'm not just saying this, because I mean, I didn't have anything to do with Jane or Mitch being a VPR, but they're national level uh, people that just happen to be at a local NPR. I think it's because they like you so much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm Lorraine Lappin, and I have been here in Vermont for 50, exactly 15 years now, and I come from the land of Terry Gross, W-H-Y-Y, and um, I was always a dedicated public radio and TV listener slash watcher. And when I moved here to Vermont, to VPR, and I, I was familiar with it before because my three children preceded me here. So I was listening to VPR for a while, and I immediately volunteered for the pledge drive. And I enjoyed that tremendously, and I really, I, I am aware that it's less expensive to do it the way it's being done out of state, contracted. But I, I really got to feel that VPR is like a family. Well, thank you, first of all. I mean, and second of all, I, w I think we need to figure out some way to take advantage of the people like you who have such a great volunteer spirit, and, and Vermont has a very high rate of volunteerism, and maybe we could, for example, one of my ideas would be to have p folks like you come in and, and call and thank the people who made a donation. Uh, very similar skill set. So instead of answering their question, you, yeah. we get their number afterwards and we call them and we say thank you, leave them a voicemail. Um, after this is over, let's let's uh, exchange information, okay. and and let's see if we can figure that out. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kathy Polowski, and I moved to Vermont in 1966 from Iowa. Oh, what part? Uh, Spencer and Shenandoah. Oh, I'm from Creston. Oh, nice. <laughs> sorry, folks. And sorry, <laughs> sorry, everybody. And uh, two things. One was in Des Moines when I was living there. There were two daily newspapers, a morning paper and an evening paper, and my dad read both of them. And then he would share them with us as to why he read both of them. And my favorite story was the morning paper said, the police were shocked, shocked when they raided a building and found that it was full of guns from floor to ceiling. And the evening paper said, when the police went to serve a warrant at the Smith & Wesson warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> so it really helped. I mean, so the very idea of having zero newspapers or newspapers doing zero local coverage, it, it's tough. My other one question is about in, income stream because I'm finding lately that pharmaceuticals advertising is it's pharmaceuticals in cars all day long and is there really going to be a movement to stop pharmaceuticals from doing broadcast advertising well I wish I, I'm going to I'm going to dance around your question politely like Iowans often do um, and say basically I think that the issue is are there in our case, we take money from, from pharmaceutical companies too, right? Uh, we call it underwriting, but it's, it's essentially like advertising. Um, and the question is, what is uh, an acceptable organization company to take money from and what's not? Um, I, could, I could, in theory, pass the buck to NPR because NPR is the organization that makes, like Purdue Farm or whatever organizations it takes money from. They're making that decision. But I shouldn't because I have a say in that. I'm a member station. And by the way, NPR is a nonprofit organization that's run by its member stations. So all, yeah, there are hundreds of us and we all have a vote on the board of NPR. Um, so I do have a say in telling NPR things. I think it's complicated. Um, no state's been harder hit from the opioid crisis in West Virginia. Um, I did a lot of coverage of it. Um, but some of these companies that are partially responsible for that are also responsible for drugs that do good and are important. Um, one thing that we do is we try to make sure that the, the words that we say about the companies on the air are truthful. They can't be promotional. There's a line there, but they can't yes. say untrue things about the company. The company can't say we're the best. Um, you know, we try to make sure that we at least regulate the wording in a way that, that keeps it from being a lie or deceitful. Um, and that's at least one step toward it. But I don't know if that answers your question about you wish that we wouldn't take money from certain companies that do what you believe are unethical things. I, I, I'll, I could do one more thing for you. Uh, Google NPR ombudsman, <laughs> and then there's a form you fill out. If enough people say it to them, they do listen. <clears throat> um, so that's another way to get your voice heard. Does anyone here think that um, uh, VPR and NPR has a bias problem of any sort? And it wants to speak to that. I'm, tr I'm actually asking for that to be raised. Um, I heard that a lot in West Virginia. Yeah, my name is Sandy Baird, and I'm uh, a longtime resident of Vermont. And I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, which, like this woman said, had two newspapers daily one that we would call a Democratic newspaper in the morning, and one that was more of a Republican newspaper in the evening. And I'm a firm believer in print journalism and also in public. Uh, television, public uh, radio, and also I'm currently involved very much in public access television uh, in our community as well. My concern is that I believe all the media has some kind of a bias, and I don't know where to get fair and balanced news, certainly not on Fox, but Fox isn't the only uh, uh, news programming that is thoroughly biased in favor of, I would guess, the Republican Party, but I also think that MSNBC is, and also CNN as well, but in the Democratic camp. And I never know where to get unbiased news. And I find that I think that public uh, radio also errs on the side of being more biased toward a liberal political stance, even though I'm probably more or less a liberal here. 
and I don't, I don't really know where to tell students or where to uh, tell anybody or for myself to get clearly a fact-based media. And you know what, it's, as, a, as a reporter, uh, it's funny how you can say a whole bunch of facts that are, that are true, but if you only select, if you select a certain way of telling a story, you can have things that are entirely true, but still biased. A good reporter ought to be trying to get if there are different side, as many different sides as you can and let each side tell its best story, make its best argument. I mean, I like that Socratic method. When I was a teacher, it was the same way. Let's try to get all sorts of different points of view and try to help them to, to make their best argument, but hold them accountable. I think the BBC actually has some really good, tough interviewing like that. Um, that's designed, it's adversarial, but it's designed to try to get people to make their best argument and not just have talking points. Um, I, I think that we are aware, let's just say that, at NPR and BPR that we have all sorts of biases. Um, so it's something we talk about a lot. Um, and we just the other day had another conversation about, for example, trying to get more diversity in our commentary. Uh, that is something that we need to work on and we are working on. And diversity means lots of things. It means ideological diversity. It means uh, race, it means age, it means occupation. One of the worst blinders we have is our audience and our listeners, not all, but tend to be college educated. And so are we listening to you know, um, some great commentary from someone who doesn't have a college degree? It, it, have we even tried? And so you know, I think that that is our struggle. And it's not, I don't think it's, an, it's definitely not intentional, at least not on my part, it's not what I see. It's a lot of, sometimes people don't see the problem, sometimes they see it, but they don't work hard enough to fix it, sometimes it's hard to fix it. I know VPR has often tried to recruit uh, people with more conservative ideologies to be commentators, and sometimes because of our history and because of how people perceive us, sometimes they don't want to come on, because there's not a trust factor there. It's really, it's hard. Um, that's why I asked the question. I'm acknowledging it, and I know we need to work on it. And the good news is that it, when you're in Vermont, you guys can keep me honest, <laughs> right? People, I mean, you're not hidden. You, people come up to me every single day and tell me how great this thing was and how horrible that thing was. And that's exactly how it should be. I'm lucky to be in a place where we still have those face-to-face -face relationships. The people at National NPR don't have as much of that. So I'm, tr I'm trying to help translate you for them so that they can hear it too. Okay. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm Annette Zeff, <clears throat> originally from Philadelphia. Uh, I'm interested in the placement of articles and the ethics of doing so. I'm thinking of a particular article I read a few years ago in the free press about a hoarder. And the photograph on the first page was all the stuff that this person had mm -hmm. in his yard. My question is, is this sig significant enough to be on the first page, is it ethical to do that? And uh, I don't think there was a third. What do you? What do you? What do you? What do you think? I'm but curious. Is, what do you oh, think? was it? Is it to sell newspapers? The shock value? I mean, I'm not attacking. I just I want to understand. What do you think? What do you think the answer is to the ethical issue? Do you think it's ethical for the paper to put that on the front page? I thought it was to sell newspapers. I, I think that one of my questions I would have is, was that person? Um, psychologically able to give consent to having their photo or not. I wouldn't know that until I talked to the person at length, but that, that would be my concern. That would, you, that would, if, if the person had consented, it would be ethical to do so. Right? And if the person is psychologically able, like sometimes if you're really depressed, you know what I mean, uh, you might not be able to give good consent. Uh, or if the person's, uh, my son has intellectual disabilities. You know, he couldn't give true consent. And so I think those are the issues you work through. When I was a young reporter, um, I, was, I, was, I would have done that story. I would have put that picture in the paper. I thought that everyone had a right to know. As I get older, um, I ch I've changed my mind and, and learned about it. And I'll tell you a story really quickly. I did a story about uh, poverty in West Virginia. Um, and we, did a, we were trying to talk about potential solutions to poverty, and so there was this one transportation service that got people from these rural areas into jobs, and, and so it was a success story, right? We go out um, to visit the trailer of the woman who is taking the bus into work every day, and out of the trailer runs these two little kids. They're very cute. They're like three and they're five. It's summer, and they're barefoot. 
and my photographer is with me and he's excited. He's like, click, 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 click. It's this iconic photo of these kids running out of the trailer to greet some guests. And we put that on the front page of the paper and the mother was furious, so angry. She hadn't consented to having those kids picture in the paper, right? We assumed and we shouldn't have. Also, she was confused because I had said this was a story about her taking the bus but the headline talked about poverty. And she said, I'm not poor. You're, you're denigrating me by calling me poor. And so that really made me step back and think about a lot of things. Um, it's a lot of times when you see that, your question was, are they doing it to sell papers? The answer is no. But the, they're, the reporter thinks that by doing that, they're doing something good when maybe they're not. I think the reporter probably really feels like I'm, I'm, I'm exposing a story that people need to know about. Um, also, your ego gets into play. Uh, you know, like, oh, this is, a, this is a story that gets a lot of clicks, a lot of people are reading it. It is about that. It, the newspaper's not, it's not about making money, but it's about the reporter's ego, actually, if I'm being really honest about it. That's why that reporter did that story, probably. They felt like it was going to do some good, but they also, it made them feel good to tell a story that lots of people were going to talk about. I'm sorry to go on, but. It's complicated. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Betsy Gardner, and I have lived in Vermont for mm, not quite all my life. <laughs> and I have a um, gripe about um, the newscasters that I listen on national news on public radio, that they get involved in these picky, picky, picky little things that happen in the news. And I would like to see, I would like to have them have some kind of a standard why, you know, the, 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 the blackface and the little silly things that come up in the news and they grab hold of it and they, they kind of push a little bit and, and they want the person they're interviewing to say more about this story. And I turn the radio off because I just don't, I, I would like them, I listen to the BBC too, and I really like the way they interview people. And, and they don't let people get away, they, and they're, they're, not, they're not afraid to say, well, that's really silly, isn't it? You know, <laughs> and, and I, think, I think some of our reporters are afraid to say that. I appreciate it. I will say that um, I learn a lot by listening to Jane Lindholm. I think she does it really well. Nobody's perfect, um, but you know, at VPR, I think she is tough while being polite at the same time. And that, as someone who's done interviews, that's a tough thing to pull off. So I hear you, and I appreciate the comment. Well, I don't want to. I don't know how long we have, and, and I don't want to bore everybody. I can. I can also stick around afterwards and, and talk and answer questions. Um, but I really, and I'm amazed at how many of you came out. To, to hear this today, I really appreciate it. If, if I, if, what, what, what do y'all want to do? Um, are we about wrapping up, you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I will stay and I want to thank you so much. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't A, thank all of you who are members of VPR. And if you're not a member of VPR, uh, it's really easy to make it right. It's, <laughs> we, have a new, we have a website called vpr.org. We just changed that. Um, if you Google VPR, it'll show up. Um, I, you know, look, I, I do a, I'm a member of this station. I'm a member of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. I'm a member in Tampa. I give money to the Front Porch Forum and Seven Days and Digger. Um, you know, I, I think that it's part of what you do. I, I try to buy local produce and milk. You know, <laughs> it's, it, 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 you don't have to give a lot. That, that's not the point, but if everyone gives just a little to whatever media source that you think is the important media source to you, whether it's VPR or something else, um, then we're gonna keep journalism strong in Vermont. Thank you very much. Thank you.